research associate at the ultrafast spectroscopy and ultrafast nanotools laboratories at the University of Alberta. Before that, she graduated with a PhD in physics at the University of Notre Dame, where she worked with someone I know relatively well in my field, um, Professor Yachin Kutina, who is one of the you know, uh, parents of the diluted magnetic semiconductors and the studies that happened um, in the 90s. Um, then she went on and became a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cincinnati, where she looked on electronic energy landscapes and exciton dynamics in individual semiconductor nanowires. And today she's going to talk to us about time of terahertz spectroscopy, and I'm curious in particular to hear about the recent development in, uh, development in uh, uh, building new intense terahertz pulse sources for nonlinear studies. Um, so thank you very much for coming, and we do this as a, as a you know, sort of uh, uh, habit. <laughs> we, uh, we give uh, a small present to everybody. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. I hope you like it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you about my recent research. I really enjoyed my visit so far. So I can share more of what I've been recently doing, in particular uh, using ultrafast broadband terahertz pulses to probe various nanomaterials. So, first of all, I'll just give you a preview of my talk. First, I'll tell you what are the terahertz pulses, how can we generate them, how can we detect them, what can we do with them. And I'll give you some examples from some of the <coughs> projects I've been involved in, specifically how we used ultrafast terahertz spectroscopy to look at the ultrafast carrier dynamics in silicon nanocrystals. Then I'll tell you about a very different system, which is how we looked at the ultrafast valence later transition in the vanadium dioxide. And I'll summarize with, um, some discussion of the new frontiers in this field and some outlook for some future work related to, to this research. So, first of all, what is the terahertz radiation? What is the terahertz um, frequency range? It's, for the longest time, it's been known as the terahertz gap. So that remained one of the last unexplored regions in the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's actually, if you look here at the diagram, it's right in between the infrared and the microwave spectrum. So what, just to give you a little general idea, 1 terahertz corresponds to the period of 1 picosecond, the wavelength is 300 micron, and, and so on and so forth, depending on what units you are used to seeing. Right, so as it's been cited in their 10 years ago in the MIT Technology Review, it's sort of their most scientifically rich yet underexplored region of, of electromagnetic spectrum. So what's so scientifically rich about it? What, what kind of physics do we expect to see in this range? Well, it's, it is quite a lot. Because of it, it's a low energy uh, electromagnetic radiation. So a lot of things, all the low energy um, excitation materials, such as uh, free carrier absorption, carrier scattering, spinways in the magnetic semiconductors, phonons, superconducting energy gates, intra excitonic transitions, all happen to have spectroscopic signatures in this terahertz range. Also in biophysics, turns out all of those very important large Y molecules have sort of this twisting and vibrational, conformation dependent vibrational modes in the terahertz range. So I mean, astronomers has actually known this field for longer than any of us have because uh, they've been looking at uh, cosmic microwave background and that's where a lot of the early detector development has occurred you know, using uh, some liquid helium cooled thermometers. Also, we know the terahertz can go through a lot of different materials, including can go from clothes, so immediately that attracted a lot of attention in the security community. Also, medical communities are now becoming very interesting because their imaging in this range seems to give you some information about, um, gives you contrast in the soft tissue, both cancerous versus healthy tissue, and so on and so forth. So, while with all this wealth, why hasn't it been explored before? And that is definitely not for the lack of trying, but for the lack of strong sources and good sensitive detectors. So 
recently, this gap has been closing quite rapidly. This is a number of, of publications <coughs> by year that were on the subject of terror herds. And you can see it, it really took off in the early 90s. And this is the number of books that have been recently published. So the question is, well, what happened? What happened right there? There's a lot of advances in different areas contributed, but definitely the deciding factor was there advent of the ultra-fast laser. It was developed in 1982, but it was early 90s when it became available to the researchers. So basically, what is an ultra-fast laser? It's a laser that can generate very short optical pulses. And specifically, we are now using the pulses with durations of less than one picosecond. Just to give you a sense of the time scale, what's one picosecond? And for so, for example, we are now using a laser that has a pulse of less than one picosecond and repetition rate of one kilohertz. That would be the same as if you would turn on their flashlight for one second and wait 32 years to turn it back on again. So basically, in this case, what happens? You have all this average power, but you condense all that to these very short optical pulses. What it leads to is that peak powers become very, very high, huge in some um, locations. Why is that important? That now allows us to use various non-linear techniques to generate other frequencies, including to generate terrorist pulses, and this is exactly how it's done. So this is the, one of the lasers that we use for terahertz generation. This is an amplified titanium sapphire laser source. So we get 10 gigawatt peak power in a single pulse. So what is then a terahertz pulse? Well, this is an example of the terahertz waveform taken in our lab. So as you can see there, period is around one picosecond time scale. It's a very short pulse, not quite single cycle, but getting close to it. So if you Fourier transform this time domain waveform, what you get is something that covers the spectral range from about 0.1 to all the way, maybe going close to 3 terahertz. So those are quite broadband because of course they're short time. So how can we make them? There are several techniques. They all rely on some, some of the sort of nonlinear technique. The one that we use most often is called optical rectification. So you come in. To the end, you expose a non-linear optical crystal, such that such as the Intelliride or some other ones that I use, uh, to ultra-fast optical pulse, right? And then through non-linear effects, specifically optical rectification, what you get out is an electromagnetic transient, which follows approximately the wave function envelope. The other way to think about it is a difference frequency generation between the various components frequency components of this optical pulse. How do we detect it? It's sort of the opposite of uh, the generation technique. And again, we're using a non-linear crystal. So this electric field of the terahertz pulse induces birefringence in these materials. And we can detect the birefringence by sending the second probe pulse. Right? So there, this electric, the electric field induced by refringence will change the polarization state, which we can detect using the balance detection, what's important here is that what we are detecting is not intensity as is done with many optical measurements. We are actually detecting electric field as a function of time. So it means it's coherent detection. We are getting information about the amplitude. We are also getting information about the phase. And that's what becomes very important in spectroscopic applications. So how do we actually use those pulses to do spectroscopy? This is a very cartoon-like representation of spectroscopy done in transmission mode. So from our source, we get the terahertz pulse, we detect it. Then we put a sample in the beam path. We send the second pulse. What happens to it? It's now it's delayed in time, and it's also attenuated. So we get a phase shift and an amplitude change. By analyzing those in the frequency domain by doing some very simple transformation without the need to rely on Kramer's chroniculation or anything like that, we can directly get the frequency resolved complex optical constants. For example, this is their uh, refractive index and absorption coefficient, or which is equivalent treatment to get the frequency resolved real and imaginary part of emittivity. So, how does that help us, for example, to look at conductivity? Well, then, uh, conductivity is a is, uh, occurs when you have
of free carriers. So of course in a semiconductor, the one terabit photon with an energy of around 4 million electron volts is not going to be able to excite the transition from valence to conduction. Band. But if there is already a free carrier and a terabit photon comes along, what happens is it can be absorbed by free carriers. So we get a spectroscopic signature from that. So also the free carrier scattering is in that range. We can also detect that. The other very important uh, thing about this technique is that we are probing this connectivity on a nanoscale length scale. The length that we are probing is given approximately by the square root of d, which is a diffusion constant, over the frequency. That just tells you how far the carrier can get before the electric field reverses direction. So we're sort of sloshing the carriers in. That's how we can probe the connectivity in the nanomaterials. So that's when it becomes very important. So, there is a number of nanomaterials that in just past years, just very recently, have been looked at as this technique quite successfully. Anything from nanoroids, nanowires, uh, fullerene plants, graphene, different kinds of nanowires. So in our group, this is sort of the, the, one of the setups that we're using for these measurements, sort of some of the people that have been involved in these measurements, but we have looked at silicon nanocrystal films, nanogranule PO2, FES2, amorphous silicon and organic materials, uh, carbon nanotubes. I will just tell you a little bit about the first two, just to give you some example. So first of all, carrier dynamics in silicon nanocrystals. So just to introduce you the, the samples that we've looked at, it was their uh, series of silicon nanocrystal films where silicon nanocrystals were embedded in SiO2, which is another name for glass. So, uh, we, we have this series of films with ranging with uh, different silicon filling fractions, ranging from 30% by volume silicon all the way to 80%. So they were, this is how they were fabricated. They grow most of the metric uh, silicon oxide, and then they anneal it, it's self segregates its face segregates, it forms these very nice enclosed uh, nanocrystals. So from TEM measurements, we know that at the one range, once at the end of the spectrum, 30%, the nanocrystals are about 6 nanometers in diameter. They're also quite well separated. Then as you increase the filling fraction, of course, they start to be touching. They start coalescing. You start getting some of these uh, pathways forming. So, so then, how do we probe photoconductivity? Right? Because that is what, for the main, uh, the driving, um, the reason behind looking at those silicon nanocrystals is, of course, photovoltaic excitations, photovoltaic devices. So we would like to know what happens to the photo excited carriers. So what we do experimentally, I'm going to back it up, show it again. First, we send the terabits pulse through unexcited sample. Then we come in with an optical pulse, which gets absorbed in a thin layer of material and creates optical excitation of three carriers there. Then we come in with the second pulse at some determined time delay after that, and we probe the conductivity at that specific time point. So we get sort of a snapshot. There's two ways to do it. In one case, which is shown here, we just sit at the peak of the terabits pulse and we monitor changes in transmission of the terabits pulse as a function of the time delay between our photo excitation and the probe pulse. So it can be shown that in the limit of small modulation where the changes in transmission are less than 20%, what we are getting is directly proportional to the photoconductivity. So here's just an example. This is the uh, redness for the bulk silicon wafer. What happens is here the excitation comes in there and the conductivity shoots up. Of course, you excited additional carriers. It stays on for a long time. Then in one of the silicon nanocrystal films, what we see it goes up, and then within the first 100 picoseconds, it, it dies. So that immediately tells us that all the carriers that we have put inside have somehow gone to some sort of defect, trap states, surface states, or something like that. So of course, we get what we directly extract the lifetimes out of this. The other way to look at it, we can, of course, fix the time delay at any point in life and take the full frequency result spectrum, giving us the conductivity, frequency result conductivity at that time point. So for example, this is the 
real and red is real and blue is imaginary conductivity for the bulk cell can take and I think this was six picoseconds after photo excitation. This is of course all nice and good, but in order to get anything useful out of it, you need to use some model so that you can fit it and then extract some useful parameters. The good way to start is of course the phenomenological group model, which treats the electrons just as a non-interacting gas with some characteristic scattering time between the collisions. Then you turn on the electric field, you get some drift velocity, you can solve the equation of motion coupled to it with the Ohm's law. What you get is this formula for the complex conductivity, and if you actually write it out, this is your real part, this is your imaginary part. Turns out, for all the simplicity of this model, it works amazingly well. It pretty much describes most of your semiconductors and all semiconductor materials very well. What you can get out of it, well, from here there's two fitting parameters. One is plasma frequency, which directly gives you the carrier density at that time after photo excitation. The other parameter is tau, which is scattering time, from which you get the mobility of the carrier. So you get all this very important information without giving any contents. Just come in with an optical pulse and you get the spectrum. Okay, so then we look at, of course, it's silicon nanocrystals. This is what we get for one of the 50 picoseconds after photo station. So, there is a problem. Of course, there's absolutely no way this can describe this. So, first of all, you get now this real conductivity that is now suppressed at low frequencies, and you get imaginary conductivity that goes negative. So, in to sell them, they detect, turns out, things like that are seen in all the materials where there is some sort of structure on that scale of the mean free path. Again, another cartoon-like representation, what happens, you excite a carrier, it sees some holes, it can occasionally bounce off, it can go through, so to describe a situation like that in 2001, Neville Smith proposed the modification to the crude model, which is now known as the Smith model, where he just introduced one additional parameter C, which is called backscattering parameter, is, um, and it varies from negative 1 to 0. In 0, you recover your normal group model. In negative 1, there, at 0 frequency, the DC conductivity becomes 0. So this is where you have com complete... So in this case, what happens is your carrier is excited within one nanocrystal, let's say, and it cannot leave it. It just basically keeps bouncing from one hole to another. When there is C equals, oh, sorry, when C equals zero, the barriers disappear. So there was some uh, discussion was of what, what does this parameter really mean physically, and we've done some extensive Monte Carlo simulations, which I'm not going to show, but their takeaway point from that is when the size of the nanocrystal is on the order of the mean free path. The absolute value of the C parameter is approximately given by the uh, probability that when this carrier encounters the boundary, it's going to scatter back rather than go forward. So it sort of defines their local, how localized are they in these nanograins. So then it turns out with, with this formula, we can reproduce, we, we can fit all of our experimental data on the silicon nanocrystal films very well. Right? So this is, I'll just show you some sampling of the data for two of the films. This is 30% uh, composition film, 30% silicon volume film fraction, and this is approximately twice as much silicon. And this is uh, taken at different times up to the excitation, 10 picoseconds, 50. 100 picoseconds after photo excitation. So two things are seen here. First of all, as you look at the different positions, let's say early times, the spectra are very different. Of course, here in the one where, where we remember from TEM, their nanocrystals are far away from each other, you see very strong localization, very strong suppression of the real conductivity, right? While in the other one, you have quite high real conductivity. The other thing that happens along the time axis is that it starts out with high conductivity. As time goes on, close to 100 picoseconds, this starts looking almost like this. So we have some 
somehow seeing the changes in the degree of localization of characters. So we see the changes in the shape and in the magnitude of connectivity. Let's first look at the changes along this silicon content uh, axis. So we know from the TEM that each sample first con uh, contains some sort of distribution of some isolated nanocrystals, some of the ones that are connected together in pathways, but our terabytes view uh, pulse samples the entire array, so we get some sort of average response. So for example, in the 30% silicon, the 10 picoseconds, we get this sort of uh, conductivity, which is described now by this localization parameter, which is very close to negative 1. And remember, negative 1 is where you get complete localization in these grades. Then we add more silicon, and the C parameter is now changed to negative 0.8. So localization now is decreased. So we have some sort of transport along the connected pathways. If you add more, it becomes even more pronounced, and it sort of continuously we can all go all the way to bulk silicon and recover the true one. If you, what you, another thing you can do, you can extrapolate this. Of course, we don't have the abandons right here at zero, but you can extrapolate the fit. That gives you the DC conductivity, which is something you would normally measure if you put the contents on. It happens to be very, actually very close to what you measure. So, when we do that and plot at different times, we plot this DC conductivity as a function of volume field fraction. What we get is described very well with a very well known percolation transition. So, what we are observing is actually percolative transfer above some sort of threshold of the filling fraction. And in turn, we are getting their um, percolation threshold at about 38% silicon, which agrees quite well with their photoconductivity measurements done in steady state. So that's also encouraging. Now let's look at the second phenomenon that we observed. What happens with the time here, right? What is happening as the time progresses up to photoexcitation? The easiest way to examine it is now to plot that C parameter, localization parameter, which we extracted all these data points as a function of time for all the different materials. Two things here. First of all, this curve, this is a, it's not really a curve, it's a line. For the sample with the, uh, with the silicon content below percolation threshold, it doesn't change. It starts off very close to negative one, just stays there. But for the other samples above percolation threshold, the carrier star will be quite able to move far along the travel along these pathways. But as time goes on, we see increasing and increasing and increasing degree of localization. So what we see is some sort of transition from long-range percolative transport to increased localization in segments of these um, multi-nanocrystalline networks. What we think is happening is of course, what happens to the carriers? They get trapped at the interface states. That's the most likely scenario. When they get trapped there, you have charges sitting there in the interfaces. You start getting something that would look like a shopkeeping area, which would prevent the next carrier that comes along from going over. So basically, as time goes on, you start to build out these barriers between the nanocrystals. So this is, of course, would be very important for the photovoltaic application. And from our experimental data, we were actually able to extract the effective diffusion lengths, which is how far your carrier can potentially go from the spot where it was photo excited. This is sort of an important figure of merit in the old days, because of course you want to excite your carriers, but you also want to be able to get them out to your electrodes. So what we are finding here that for the films with composition above about 60%, the effective diffusion length is over 100 nanometers. That is already doable with the modern lithographic techniques. That tells us that nanocrystal films can indeed be used as active layers in photovoltaic devices. So that was an important result taking them out of it. So just to summarize this work for the silicon nanocrystal film, what we see is a transition from long-range conduction at early times of the photoexcitation to enhanced localization at later times. We also estimate the diffusion lengths, and hopefully this is, I'm starting to convince you that terahertz time is all terahertz spectroscopy is indeed a very useful tool to study conductivity in nanomaterials without the need for contacts. And now I'm going to tell you about a very different system where we applied similar technique to study the conductivity.
taking the lettuce, the melanin to later transition and be able to its nanogranular, but in this case that actually turns out to not be important at all. So what's so interesting about vanadium dioxide? Well, at low temperatures, it's an insulator, and it has this monoclinic structure. And this monoclinic structure, green here, that shows the vanadium ions, they are dimerized. They form this dimer that also tilted slightly from the c-axis of the vertical. Okay? But when the temperature increases to about 350 degrees Kelvin, those dimers break. So effectively, you are having your uh, unit cell. Also, there, so the structure changes from monoclinic to rutile, and thus the material becomes a metal, right? So it has been known for quite some time, but the origin of this transition, specifically the origin of the insulated state, is still, it has been debated for decades and is still debated. So some people are, of course, immediately looking at it and saying, okay, you have some sort of degradation. That is a signature of the Parallels distortion, and that is a Parallels distortion. So it must be sort of this band uh, insulators, Parallels insulated state. The other people are saying, no, to actually get this kind of insulating behavior, you need to consider electron-electron interaction. So it's actually many body effects, it's a mod insulator. Then, relatively recently, in 2005, another theoretical paper came out and said, well, you're both right. You actually need both. You need the dimers and you need the, to consider uh, many body effects to get this insulated state. This is already complicated enough, but the story gets even more interesting because in addition to temperature, it turns out, as it was observed I think in 1994, you can drive this transition from insulating to metallic state by an ultra-fast optical pulse. So what happens then is that with the, you know, it was first observed in 1994. What happens is that this optical pulse, it of course excites, it, uh, excites electron out of this dimer state, and we see this ultra-fast transition to the metallic state, which then lasts for nanoseconds. Again, no quite, uh, no theory so far has been able to quite explain all this. So there are some, there's been a number of important experimental works, and I'll just highlight a few that are important to understand this material. One was the work by Andrea Cavallari, where they used their reflectance measurements with the varying pump, this is here, this is the, their station pump pulses, with the varying duration of the pump pulse, and they were looking at how fast the transition occurred. They found that it can be as fast as 80 femtoseconds. That told them that most likely this transition is non-thermal. And what they mean by that is it's not that the laser pulse comes in and just heats your sample about the transition and then you have the metallic state. This is way too fast for any thermal transition to occur. The other important work came from the terahertz study by Kubler. And they had a very broadband terahertz source going all the way to 10 terahertz. What they saw is this um, infrared pulse coherently excites the population of the phonon mole, which is centered around six terahertz. Now it is, has been known before that in vanadium dioxide there are two phonon modes around, one around 5.8, one around 6.7, which are the modes that sort of stretch and twist this diagram. So they are thinking that this is some sort of combination of those two modes. And they believe that there that actually excitation of this phonon mode is very important for this transition because the idea that they had is that you are exciting one electron out of this dimer state there and it destabilizes this vanadium diamond and it starts oscillating between their, their insulating position and their conducting position. And finally, if the threshold is, uh, is met, then it settles in their metallic lattice or in the rutile lattice in this case. And finally, the work by uh, David Hilton, uh, also in 2007, showed that as you are approaching with the temperature, as you are approaching their transition, the material becomes more and more susceptible to this photo-induced change. That 
again sort of said that, well, maybe there is an interplay between the thermal and non-thermal mechanisms. So the question remains, is this transition thermal? If it's not thermal, what is it that determines this transition when it occurs? What is the threshold and things like that? So this is what we set out to try to answer by using terahertz spectroscopy. But before we can do photo excited terahertz spectroscopy, terahertz spectroscopy or photo excited transition, we needed to first understand the thermal transition. So what we did, and this is actually the sample that we have, a nanogranular sample that was grown at INRS and Quebec. So the grains are quite large, so we don't actually see any effects from the grain boundaries. The reason why everybody using the granular samples rather than single crystalline, single crystalline samples do exist, but upon thermal cycling they tend to crack. So there's just a difficulty using them. So the film was 130 nanometers thick. So what we did is we uh, studied it at the same time as the normal 4.0 measure conductivity and terahertz spectroscopy without any excitation, just through the thermal transition. So these are the terahertz waveforms transmitted through just the substrate and the sample with the substrate. These are the waveforms below the transition, and this is above the transition. Below the transition, you see there's no difference. The sample doesn't do anything because, of course, it's insulated. There's no free carriers, no other species that can absorb terahertz in this particular bandwidth that we have. Then, as we heat it up, the transition drops at the peak to almost 34%, by almost 34%. So, uh, as I showed you before in silicon nanocrystal case, and I'm not going to show this, it's not so important to look at those spectra, but from the spectra we can, we can fit it and we can get the carrier density. This is an important number that helped us later analyze the photo industry. We know that in the fully metallic, fully switched state, the carrier density is 5 to the 2 times 10 to the 20 electrons per centimeter cubed. If we actually normalize, we, we take the spectra as we go through transition, heat it up, and then cool it back down, we, uh, if we normalize the carrier, the instantaneous carrier density to this number, we can actually get the fraction of the grains that have been switched. Here, this is our heated, transi heated transition, cool transition. Uh, the other thing you see, it actually reproduces quite well your normal full weight probe measure, which was very reassuring to see. So, what we did then, now that we know that uh, critical electron density, we have actually done optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy to look at this onset of their uh, photo induced transition in a wide range of temperatures going all the way from 10K to the thermal transition and in a quite wide range of all fluences. And this is just an example of some of the spectra that some of the decays that we're getting at two different temperatures. So you can see that we're getting, depending on where we are in sort of uh, fluence and temperature space, we get different signatures. In some cases, what we get is this immediate, this uh, short, very short-lived spike in conductivity that goes right back down. In some other cases, we get this short increase, and then we have the conductivity that, that lasts for a long time, but it's quite low. We know, of course, that at the peak, when the whole film is switched, we get about 34% modulation in transmission. So here, for example, it's only 3%. It's very, very little, but it stays almost unchanging. In some other cases, we get this first step, and then long time slow rise, which actually occurs over about 100 picosecond time scales. And then if we go in higher, we see something that almost looks like a step function. It goes on and it switches, and then immediately we know that it's completely switched, because it, it now reaches that 34% threshold, so we switch the entire field. So we can actually plot this different thresholds for these behaviors, and we can populate some sort of phase diagram. So for specifically, we've sort of decided, because we have the main thing is the induction of this metallic state, then also this slow rise transition, and the complete transition. To characterize, so uh, this initial induction, we, we, we looked at their photoconductivity, 
sensitivity at 5 picoseconds after photo excitation. To quantify that slower rise, we actually look at the difference between value at 25 and value at 5 picoseconds. If that difference is larger, considerably larger than zero, then we do indeed see the slow rise. And then finally, we've looked at the threshold for seeing the fully metallic state form either at 5 picoseconds or 25 picoseconds. What we are getting is their phase diagram that looks something like that. So these symbols here, these, they're, all, they're completely, almost completely overlapping. They're the thresholds for achieving this metallic state at 5 and 25 picoseconds. Then these circles, they are the threshold for, for after, if at, at high affluences, what we get is the slow rise <coughs> behavior. Then these symbols over here, and again, they're almost overlapped, it's the achieving this full metallic, they're about 34% modulation in transmission at either 5 or 25 uh, picoseconds after excitation. So, okay, we have this phase diagram. What does it all mean? The first question that we wanted to ask ourselves was, is this transition thermal? So, and for that, we can actually, we know there are uh, thermal properties of the material. We know the heat capacity, the latent heat, and all, all things like that. So we can actually calculate how much fluids we need to heat the sample. For example, to heat just the top layer of the sample to the onset of this metallic transition, just to start it. And that was this curve then we can calculate how much fluids we would need to heat the sample there, to give the average sample temperature to the transition temperature to, to where the film would be switched. And that is this curve. And then finally to give it to heat the back side of the sample, uh, of the sample to the above transition temperature, that would be this. Of course, what we have seen experimentally, the threshold is significantly lower than those predictions. That tells us that the response, the, the ultra-fast uh, response is non thermal in nature. But then the question is, well, what can be related to? Remember that when we have this photo-induced metal and insulated metal transition, there's two things that are happening. This optical excitation, first of all, excites the electrons from this vanadium dimer, so the mod state, so it excites some electron density, but it also excites coherently terahertz phonons that are needed for the structural rotation. The phonon modes that would map insulated state to metallic state. And the important thing to understand to remember here that those modes are excited coherently. That's why the thermal predictions are also high. Thermally, you can you are exciting all phonon modes. Looks like with the photo with the uh, ultra-fast pulse, you are exciting selectively just this mode that is needed for the structural transformation to occur. So with that in mind, let's first look at their critical electron density. So we can calculate, we, we know that 5.2 times 10 to the times 20 is the carrier density that we see in metallic state. We can calculate, assuming that all the absorbed photon create at least one electron, the line one actually gives us the fluence that is needed to create this critical density of the electrons at the front, at the top surface of the sample. And it happens to coincide with the onset of the teletransition, particularly at the low temperature regime. The other thing is, these other ones that are now temperature dependent, here is where we need consider the density, critical density of phonons. Again, we know that at 350 degrees Kelvin, sample is metallic, the mission is driven by temperature change. We can calculate this from the thermodynamic distribution, we can calculate the critical density of phonons, so this uh, 6 terahertz phonons at this transition temperature, and we know the critical density that is needed to, to drive this thermally. Then it turns out that at low temperatures what you need your laser to do is to excite more phonons just to bring the dense 
dense, uh, the critical dense to print the density of the six terahertz phonons, the structural realization phonons, just over this number that's needed for relaxation. That's why this would be temperature dependent. And this is exactly the line two that we're getting here. This is the this is their uh, fluence that would be necessary to excite the critical density now of transition phonons at the front of the surface. Right? So here in the region A, we never form metallic state. We see some sharp spike and conductivity goes right back down, right? But then above, above this line, you know we now exciting the critical density of electrons, at least in the part of the sample, but we also exciting the critical density of phonons, which act like a structural trigger. So what happens in that case, what we believe happens in that case, we are nucleating metallic domains, but then the area around them now has this critical density of phonons, and these domains can grow. And we believe that 100 picosecond of slow rise is actually showing us how those domains are growing. And actually, uh, there was uh, work which was optical pump x-ray probe, and they actually showed that the lifetime of those six, six terahertz phonons is about 100 picoseconds, so that would be very consistent with this picture. The interesting state occurs in between, right? This is where above, the fluence is above what's needed to excite the critical electron density, but below what's needed to excite those phonon densities. This is where we get this onset of conductivity, and then nothing happens. So we do excite, we do create those metallic domains, and they stay there. They are not growing. This is actually the first observation of such state, which has been predicted in that theoretical paper, where they have said that there may be an intermediate metallic state, which is with lattice distortion, but already the mod state has been broken. So you break the, uh, the mod insulating state, but not the structural. You don't have a structural transformation. Now, then finally, if you go up the fluence, this line corresponds to the fluence that would be required to excite, in addition to electrons, the critical density of phonons, those are, sorry, transition phonons, at the back of the circle of, of the field. And of course, then in region D, you immediately can switch in the ultrafast in the sub picosecond time range, you can switch the entire field metallic. So to summarize, we have created this phase diagram for the ultrafast um, phase transition in vanadium dioxide. We have shown that the thermal prediction are not inconsistent with our data. So the transition is actually driven by the combination we need both critical density of electrons and critical density of phonons uh, to drive this transition specifically. Low temperature, the initial onset of conductivity is driven by their critical electron density. But the relationship between these thresholds is still very much an open question that will take probably, you know, the theorists taking a look at it with the new data that's available trying to explain this further. So hopefully now I've convinced you that using terahertz um, pulses as a probe to study materials is very powerful to me. But so far, we have been sort of relegated to the role of observers. What we would also like to do is to not just probe all these effects, but somehow coherently excite them and control them. For that, of course, you need to have very high energy terahertz pulses. And it turns out that we can now generate those broadband terahertz pulses with sufficient energy that we can now do that. So I believe this is actually the, uh, the new frontier of the ultra-fast studies on materials. How do we generate those pulses? Well, as I told you earlier, we rely on nonlinear effects in uh, semiconductors to generate optical, uh, to generate terrorist pulses by optical rectification. For that process to be efficient, you need to have a high nonlinear <coughs> coefficient. The inorganic material is probably the highest nonlinearity is lithium niobate, which is excellent. It's almost three times as high as intellurane, so it would be wonderful material. Except there is a problem, right? So the refractive index is very different for 800 nanometers, which is what we use to generate terminus pulses and the terminus pulse wave itself. This is what would happen that you propagate this terminus pulse. And then their ter sorry, but, uh, the 800 nanometer pulse, and then the terahertz wave is, gets generated out like this Cherenkov cone. Because of this mismatch, it 
velocities. That process is very inefficient because now we have very short interaction lengths. They, they do not propagate together, so their, their transfer of excitation from the optical wave to a terahertz wave is inefficient. So this cone actually happens to have this, this angle of about 63 degrees. So uh, about 10 years ago, Handling and collaborators proposed a very elegant way to overcome this problem. And that is by tilting their pulse front of the excitation B. So if we actually tilt the pulse front by exactly this angle, 60, about 63 degrees, what happens is now the, the, their optical excitation beam is tilted like that, and in this direction, in the terahertz generation direction, now it, they propagate together, and they all their generated terahertz waves interfere constructively, and now we have this plane wave of terahertz being emitted in this direction. For that to happen, now we need to actually take this lithium ion wave crystal and cut it to this 60 by 63 degrees exactly to get this sort of phase matching configuration. How do we tilt this optical pulse fragment? We use a grating to do that. That's, that's the simplest way to tilt the pulse fragment is to use an optical grating. So this is a very simplified diagram of the setup that we use right now. And we have successfully generated one microjoule terahertz pulses using this setup. To make this meaningful at one microjoule, what you end up having is you can calculate the peak electric field, what you end up having is over 200 kilovolt per centimeter. That is quite high in electric field. Right now we actually increase the power that we increase the energy to form microjoules in electric field by a factor of two. So this is the, the, the waveform that we're getting. It's now actually really almost a single cycle electromagnetic pulse. This is the bandwidth we're getting. And this is when we image the spot at the focal point get about 1.5 millimeter spot of the terahertz radiation, terahertz electric field here. So we have done a number of studies on biological materials using this terahertz pulses. But of course, the main goal for this developing this uh, source was to look at nonlinear uh, dynamics in semiconductors or, or in nanomaterials, which we're yet to do, but I think it would be very exciting to continue working towards that just in light of some recent works that have been reported by other groups. And this, of course, this is very recent. So this was just published in uh, 2011, and uh, this is a German group. What they've done now, when we're talking about optical pulses or terahertz pulses, we're usually ignoring the magnetic field because it's, it's low, right? But when you get to electric fields, which in this case, they have 0.4 megavolt per centimeter, this is when you can no longer ignore a magnetic field because it becomes 0 0.13 tesla. That's now is considerable. So they looked at material called it. it's nickel oxide. It's an antifermagnetic material, which has been known to have a spin wave or magnon mode right at one terahertz. So what they did is they sent the terahertz pulse in, and now they probe the sample with a very short spin, eight femtosecond pulse, and they, they look at the Faraday rotation. What they get is this coherent oscillation, which persists for quite some time. When they then take the Fourier transform of this, they get exactly this magnetic mode. So they actually successfully launched the spin wave mode into this material. I don't have this picture here now, but actually what they can do after this has been launched, they can come into the second pulse, and depending on the phase relationship, they can either fill it or enhance it. So now you have some sort of way to, in ultra-fast, fashion without any context to turn on and turn off spin waves. Other example was carbon nanotubes. That was a Japanese group that looked at that. They've taken semiconducting uh, carbon nanotubes with their band gap of about one electron volt. They come in with this intense terahertz pulse, and what they see is they see excitons. For how can that happen? Well, band gap is about one electron volt. Right, meaning it's almost three orders of magnitude higher than the energy of single terahertz photon. 
what the equilibrium is happening, you need to, to consider what's called quantum energy, which is the cycle average energy of their electrons oscillating in their AC electric field. And it happens to depend on electric field, but also inversely depend on the square root frequency. The frequency of the terahertz radiation, of course, is much lower than the optical radiation. And in this case, it turns out that in upper nanotubes, also the mass is quite low, so this energy becomes much larger than the band gap. So what they believe they're seeing is sort of some sort of tunnel ionization, they're ionizing the gear, and that's how they're creating the excitons. So exciton generation by impact ionization induced by terahertz pulses. So in the final example that I want to show you, this was done on their uh, gallium arsenide algas on wells. They looked at the cold temperature. They can excite quasi CW. If you use quasi CW uh, laser to excite photoluminescence, of course, you see the photoluminescence peak. This is all centered around 1.42 eV. Great. But then when they come in with a terahertz pulse, what they see is a huge increase in intensity. This was like they, they, they uh, chopped this pulse to make it into 15 nanosecond pulses, and when they, they timed it to their terabits pulse, so what they see is 10,000 fold increase in, in intensity. What they think is happening? Well, the optical excitation generates carriers, many of them go in some sort of defect or trap states. What this electric field of terabits pulse does. It ionizes all those carriers, sort of flushes them out of those impurity states. And now they can form excitons and they can recombine radiating. So that way they can actually turn on the optical emission or significantly enhance it. So this is something that I believe is really a new frontier, which is where a lot of interesting physics is most likely going to be done. So this is something that I would like to do in the future is use intense terabits pulses study the samples, and of course you can probe what's happening with various techniques. You can either probe with another low intensity terahertz pulse to see what's happening with their activity, or you can probe with optical pulses and detect either changes in their transmission or it detect changes in photon for the emission. So this is one of the things that I would like to do in the future. So just their future outlook, I'm mostly interested in studying their optical and electronic properties of various nanomaterials, like nanocrystals, nanowires, specific carbon nanomaterials, as well as the organic semiconducting systems, which would have relevance for the new flexible electronics, for the new um, photovoltaic devices, and so on. And it's, you know, a lot of the physics that is relevant to the operation of those devices actually occurs on a very short time scale which is where ultra-fast techniques comes in. So it's very important to look at the, pro at the electronic excitation in these materials on the ultra-fast time scale. Finally, there's new frontier of controlling and manipulating carriers and excitations in nanoscale materials with intense terahertz pulses. So just to summarize, I hope I've convinced you that terahertz spectroscopy is the wonderful tool to study nanomaterials, specifically conductivity in nanomaterials, and intense terahertz pulses can help us look at new physics and help us look at some non-linear effects of these materials. So I'll again finish with this. The terahertz technology is the most scientifically rich, yet underutilized regions of electromagnetic spectrum, which I absolutely
But controlling polarization of the terrorist field is a very interesting area. We can now very accurately control linear polarization by using sort of Lagrange polarizers, which is what we have. I have uh, looked at, let's say, aligned uh, carbon nanotube films where that became very important because we see hugely different results when we probe along the nan nanotubes versus perpendicular. The problem right now is there's no good, let's say, quarter wave plate. We can't really make circular polarized terahertz waves. Some people are working on maybe some liquid crystals that would be able to do that. There's the terahertz optics and the, the, the actual optical um, devices. That is still very actively being developed, and there are a lot of things that we still don't have that, that are readily available in optical fields. But yes, that will be something that will be very interesting to do. Going on that a little bit further, you talked about the difficulty of making non nanocrystals of vanadium oxide yes. because they crack when thermally cycled. Have people looked at the polarization effects of non nanocrystal vanadium oxide and how? Uh, the orientation of that ends up mattering. I am not so familiar with work on how orientation would matter, but yes, they have, people have done some uh, polarizing microscopy on these. So this is how I think they actually, there's a work by Pazova, I believe the first author, is they actually mapped out in reflection, using polarized reflection, they mapped out how those domains grow. They actually, that again, one of the things, just didn't have time to talk about it, but it, confirms our idea of the domains growing. They, and they see that those metallic domains start out small and then you see this sort of spreading out of this field. And that, I believe, was done using polarized. Yeah. In the vanadium dioxide example, what, what's the magnitude of the virus distortion? You said that the vanadium atoms dimerize. Yes, they dimerize. And I actually on one of the diagrams, it's like um, 220 astrum shift. I know they also shift by about 30 degrees from the C axis somehow, but I actually don't I don't have the number of them right now for the magnitude. Can you go back to the slide where you showed the decay of C not to be so dynamic or something? Yeah. So maybe, maybe there's something that I'm missing about this, but you had a an explanation in terms of localization yes, yeah. at the boundaries. So, in my understanding of this modified periodic model, the C is, is time independent. Yes. Right? So, this time dependence you're showing is coming from the distance until the probe. So, oh, hold on, let me just go. Oh, yeah, this is, this is, this yeah. is the one. So, shouldn't I just understand this like, you know, there's many dissipation mechanisms at this energy and time scale. So, why why is it, why is it something more exotic like globalizing? Part of Actually, the C, sorry, I, I didn't uh, understand the first part of the question initially. The C parameter is actually what varies with time. So this localization, this is the, the time variation of the C parameter. So we see everything else, like the scattering, staying the same. Of course, the number of carriers is decreasing because they're getting trapped. But uh, the main thing, the main change that we see is in the shape of the connectivity which is then reflected by the change in this localization parameter. This is what sort of led us to believe that we are seeing this change from initially uh, less localized to more localized transport. If I understand the second part. Okay, I guess I just, it's not entirely clear to me why it has to be localization and not just energy loss of carriers from local dissipation mechanisms. Interesting question, but uh, what, what signatures would you expect to see in, in, if that were a dissipation? Well, I might expect to see something, so, so something like this, right? <laughs> so basically, the carrier is losing their momentum rate to her. Uh, in this case, I think that that's maybe a naive view of that. I would expect their, uh, let's say, their tau to change. In our case, the tau follows Menheisen's rule. It's a combination of scattering, no bulk scattering. And we actually see, I don't have it here, we see that it follows, we can actually predict the size of the nanocrystal because it's a, it's a combination of scattering from boundaries and scattering from the bulk defects. And we find that that description to be quite accurate and that is what does not change. But 
but if, if, if they're curious now, if let's say their velocity would have been lowered, we, we would see less scattering of boundaries. But we do see, I couldn't show it here in a long time, but we do see the tau stays constant, so that may be one clue why that might not be the case. When you first started talking about uh, max scatter and you introduced this prayer, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you guys have done some like Harlow studies. Yes. So, uh, can you go elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, what we it's we basically modeled the dynamic results as the uh, array of boxes. So in this box, what we what we did is uh, you introduce the carrier, right? And then you, you apply electric field as an impulsive electric field. And you're looking at the resulting, and you're um, what we're what you're varying is their um, permittivity of those boxes. So, for example, if, if it's 80 percent, then it's an 80 percent chance of it going back. And the other 20 percent, what we've done is actually it exits the box, enters from the other side, kind of thing. And by varying this uh, reflection coefficient and the size, we were able to get exactly this kind of behavior. This the negative conductivity, imaginary conductivity, and the real conductivity, which again can be fit by this model. So hopefully the paper on that will come out this year. So we're working on that. But we could reproduce the same shapes of conductivity by varying this reflection coefficient and the size of the box. So I was wondering, uh, you know, if um, we could that something similar in this bulk heterojunction organic system. Yes. I don't know if you're familiar with those uh, systems, but you know, a cartoon of them would be exactly like your uh, uh, connected uh, network of uh, silicon nanocrystals, more or less, right? Because, yes, see. Yeah, of course, it's made with, through totally different <laughs> methods, but I think that's the general idea, right? That you end up getting this sort of Something like this. Yeah. That right. was that was work done by uh, Dave Cook at McGill University quite recently, and that's exactly this bulk heterojunction. junction. We have fullerenes which act as an electron acceptors. You put them in their organic, in their conducting polymer, and yes, they have studied it. And I, I, they just I, I didn't show the picture with the connectivity. Yes, it does look very similar. They are now looking at these materials which. It is very interesting. Yes. 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 Yes.